fabulous. As people will come in, they will get their information about recording. Welcome everyone. I'm just going to give a couple of minutes for everyone to come in. Now there is a re there is a, a captioning channel for anyone who'd like it. And of course on Slack is our chat channel. So if you want to go to the Slack channel um, for the deep dive A7, you'll find the link to the recapped uh, captioning on there. Right. I think we're just about here. We're just missing Fiona. I'm not sure if we've got her in here yet. I can't see. I'll just quickly ping her. I think she's just arrived. Oh, look at that. Wonderful. Excellent. Apologies. I didn't know I had to join a breakout room. Oh, there you go. I was just about to uh, send you a quick note on Skype to remind you the breakout rooms are open. So I think we have, well, we certainly have our crew here and we've got um, some lovely uh, people that have joined us for this session today. So we might get underway um, and then people can just join in as they find the breakout rooms at the bottom. So I'll expect a few people to come in. Just a reminder, we're not using the chat function today. So that's been disabled just because that can interfere with anyone who's using assistive technology. Um, there is the chat capability on the uh, Slack channel, which is the A7 uh, Deep Dive Immersive Innovation Slack channel. So please go there for anyone who'd wish to ask any questions that doesn't wish to just turn your um, microphone on and ask them directly. You're welcome to at any point participate. This The idea of this particular session, these deep dives, is that they're really interactive and that we will be having them, um, you know, you're welcome to turn your mics on, ask questions at any time. Um, we'll also have some some kind of semi-structured uh, content or some structured content we'll share and some, some open questions to everyone as well. Just before we get underway, has anyone got any accommodations that um, would be, you'd like to share that would make this session easier for you? Please feel free to just ask now or if you can either mm. directly ping me mm. in uh, in the Slack channel, or you can uh, uh, put it in the, the immersive uh, A7 channel. Right, well, let's get underway. This is a fabulous topic. I mean, immersive and innovative uh, and how to demystify it, how to make this easier for people to more profoundly change the product services and environments that we have around us more inclusively. So, sorry, let me just swap uh, my notes here. Um, so we've got a few people just to introduce you to today that will be co-facilitating this with me. Um, uh, for, for just for those I haven't met before, lovely to meet you. I'm Christine Hempel. I'm the Managing Director of Open Inclusion. Open is uh, an inclusive in insight, design and innovation agency based in the UK, but now also operating in the North America and elsewhere. Um, I've been a really proud member of the XRA, um, XR Access community since 2009 and I've been a past leader of the inclusive design for XR Workstream here at XR Access um, and a current member of the coordination engagement team. So this is a topic that is really important to me and um, I'm delighted to, to see this community grow and thrive. Um, and I open our uh, the business that I uh, run has been really actively engaged in immersive technologies for a number of years now, running mainly qualitative user research and supporting some really fabulous design and innovation across this space. And we've got some of the participants um, and people we've engaged with here in the room today that I'd love to introduce you to. So we will be running this session on uh, demystifying immersive innovation and the three people who will be co-hosting here with me today um, I'd love to just introduce them quickly to you. So firstly is Fiona. Um, Fiona Kakeli is the acting head of Immersive at the Story Futures Academy. That's the National Centre for Immersive Storytelling run by the National Film and Television School and Royal Holloway University and funded by UK Research and Innovation. The Story Futures Academy develops cutting edge research and, and training programs to ensure that the UK creative workforce is the most skilled in the world, particularly in augmented, virtual and real-time technologies for immersive storytelling. 
Welcome, Fiona. Lovely to be here. Thank you, Christine. And thank you, thank you, Fiona. And uh, next across to Lewis Cannon. Um, Lewis uh, is the a uh, he and they is a UI UX designer at Hyperluminal Games in the UK and part of the cohort um, at Hyperluminal that's working to improve the accessibility and inclusivity of all apps and games for the Hyperluminal game um, that Hyperluminal Games produces. Um, hello to Lewis. Hello, happy to be here. Thanks, Lewis. Lovely to have you here. And thirdly, um, Faye Allen from Sugar Creative. Faye is the lead immersive uh, developer and games designer of Sugar Creative. And Sugar Creative is a creative innovation studio based in the UK who focuses on creative application of emerging technologies to create experiences and games across a range of sectors, including entertainment, medicine, learning, and the arts for clients, including the BBC, Ubisoft, National Museum Wales, and the UK government. Welcome, Faye. Hi, it's really nice to be here. Fabulous. If we just do a very quick um, visual description and pronouns, um, apologies, I've just stepped straight into this and not done that yet. Um, this is Christine. Um, I'm a white middle-aged female, um, uh, bobbed, bobbed hair, looking slightly uh, shabby today, wearing a green shirt. Um, my pronouns are she and her. If I can pass Fiona to you. Thanks, Christine. My pronouns are she and her, and I am wearing um, a brown top. I've got going very grey hair that's a slightly wild on a Friday afternoon, um, like Christine, looking a bit tired, um, with a very busy bookshelf behind me. Thanks. Over to you, Faye. Hi, I'm Faye. Uh, pronouns are she, her. I'm wearing a white and blue striped shirt. I've got a pair of headphones on. Uh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Faye. And over to you, Lewis. Hi, I'm Lewis. Uh, my pronouns are he, they. I have messy, curly, bleached hair. My dark roots showing a scraggly beard, but I have a blue shirt on today, and I am a white uh, male in his late 20s. Thanks so much, Lewis. So that's us. Um, it would be great to uh, know a little bit about everyone who's come into this session today. Um, you should have a link to some notes um, that I, I think are dropped. Let me make sure that they are. I'll just drop these notes in case they're not into the Slack channel now. Um, I just put them into the deep dive Slack channel. Um, and if everyone can please just put in their name, their pronouns, their organisation, their title, and if you'd like to, you're welcome to put your email so that we can, you know, people can connect with each other, but completely up to you whether you'd like to or not. Just while you're doing that, um, and does everyone uh, have access to that? That should, you should be able to find that in that Slack channel if you are in there. I can see some people going in there now, so hopefully that's working well for people. Uh, I do not appear to be a part of that channel. I couldn't see it. Ah, let me just put... Hmm, I don't, of course, have... If you go to the search bar at the top of the XR Access Symposium and you put deep dive forward slash A7, you should be able to find that. It might not come up immediately. I had the same problem actually with um, the moderator's channel. But it's deep dive forward slash A7 and then hopefully that will come up for you. Ah, brilliant. Excellent. So just while people are jumping in there and putting in uh, details, let me give you a little bit of an introduction to the case study that we're going to share today. Apologies, I've got my eyes on another screen. I'm going to bring them over here so that I'm not looking the other way. So earlier this year, Story Futures and InGame, the creative clusters for the UK for immersive storytelling and game innovation, commissioned Open Inclusion to deliver an inclusive innovation lab for XR. It was held over four days in early July, uh, sorry, early April. Um, it was absolutely fabulous and it included 10 SMEs that were really motivated, both five 
uh, creative gaming studios and five creative immersive story um, telling agencies that were selected from a competitive application process. So we're you know, really creative and um, you know, very motivated and some lovely uh, range of different creative underpinnings of games that they're designing up or stories that they're telling through immersive formats. The sessions were grounded in Open's Inclusive Innovation Framework, which really looks at how do you infuse the innovation cycle from inspiration through to ideation onto incubation when you're making and iterating the product and then onto implementation, getting it out into the market you know, in a sustainable and effective way. And it was how do you do that with really effective market and design insights, specifically drawing on pan disability um, community to ensure that it works consistently and delightfully for everyone. This framework's really been infused with the challenges, options and learnings from specific immersive technologies across the XR Access community as well. So we ran a range of workshops earlier in the year with the XR Access community, particularly the inclusive design community and XR Access um, to inform that, that process. The lab, the four day lab itself was highly interactive and it produced a, a really uh, wonderful number of opportunities across the days for participants to directly engage with the gamers and XR enthusiasts from across the pan disability community, but also with each other and to learn from their own experiences in creating, designing and developing uh, experiences in immersive technologies. There was plenty of learning shared across each of the studios and their really different approaches um, you know, were, were really informative to us as well as to each other. At the conclusion of the lab, each studio pitched for an idea um, for the inclusive concepts that they had to be developed within their existing or near to market IP. From that, two were selected onto the accelerator, which is still running. And those organizations are here with us today. That's Sugar Creative from the Story Futures cohort and Hyperluminal Games from the in-game cohort. So it's hence the um, introduction to, to this wonderful group. Um, Fiona is here from Story Futures and we'll tell it through the perspective of you know, this case study through the perspective of Story Futures that were one of the commissioners of this program, Lewis from Hyperluminal Games and Faye from Sugar Creative. We'd also love to hear about your experiences, your successes, challenges or anything that you've learned while innovating inclusively in XR. So how have you engaged with users throughout that process, particularly those with additional needs? Um, how has innovating in immersive formats made this harder or easier than when in other formats, whether that's 2D digital or a physical environment or product? And how have you transitioned from insights to design decisions and then from those design decisions to the product outcomes, making it real? Was this smooth or was it bumpy? And is there anything that you'd like to share that could help others across this experience? So that's the case study. Any questions just on the case or comments or thoughts just on the work that we've been doing this year within that case study before I jump into some questions to that group? Sorry, I'm flicking between. Right. Well, let me, sorry, I'm flicking back between different experiences here. Um, Fiona, could you maybe start talking to us about the intention, given that this was you know, a program that you and Sean from um, InGame really commissioned and set up. What was it that really want, made you want to establish the Immersive Inclusive um, Innovation Lab and Accelerator? And how did you feel it would align to the Story Futures Academy goals and benefit creative immersive storytellers in the UK? Thanks, Christine. Um... Well, I think we're probably all aware um, um, of, of the fact that the UK is already really well known for and has a reputation for creating world leading immersive content games and experiences. And our role at Story Futures Academy is to support those UK immersive and games companies to be able to do just that, to take up the opportunities, the global opportunities that are out there. And we can support them to do that by providing access to new research, training and production support. But it's also central to supporting the success of our UK companies on a global scale is, um, is, is to how to really help them create good experiences and not just good experiences comparatively to what's being created in other territories, 
but good experiences that fundamentally work for all. And the linchpin to that is excellent user design. And it's always been the proof point for any project and one um, always one area that can stop a really good experience becoming a really, really great one. And we know that really good user design and really good user experience happens by bringing inclusive design thinking into the design development and production process. Um, and we know that many content creators here in the UK really struggle with that because they don't have access to the skills, the knowledge, the contact base um, in order to kind of get there. So we wanted to find a way of trying to um, kind of make that happen um, by providing the training and access to the expertise um, and empower companies to create even better world leading um, experiences. So we worked with InGame and we worked with Open Inclusion to create a programme that I'm really happy with because it did two things. It provided that training, but at the end of the training process, it gave companies um, some funding. So a production budget to actually put what they've learned into practice and to create a mini showcase, an exemplar of actually what immersive content can look like if when you embed inclusive design at the heart of it. Fiona, I think, yeah, thank you so much for that answer. And I think there's a few things that, you know, we found so compelling when we were first, you know, engaging and talking about this. And it was that ability to share knowledge into, you know, some very motivated organisations already. And I think that knowledge went beyond the organisations, um, you know, the, the organisations that came into the learning themselves had greater confidence to go off and develop this even, you know, when they didn't get the funding to go forward within the program. So I think there was just such a, a great opportunity to demystify as you know, this the title of this session is the process of engaging with people to make an experience more consistently delightful um, for for everyone, irrespective of their access needs. And then of course, to be able to use that as an exemplar through these two programs we'll be now talking to, um, to actually showcase the outcomes of that is, is um, you know, fabulous to see. And, and we're really looking forward to, you know, to seeing the outcomes as they're de delivered through these two organizations. So perfect segue across to you, Faye. For Sugar Creative, you know, what was it that really incentivized you when you heard about this program to apply for it? And what were you looking to get out of it? So Sugar Creative is a innovation studio and we've always had value-based growth as one of our milestones. We want to make sure that everything we make is inherently valuable. We don't wanna just make things for the sake of making them. And this seems like it would be a real challenge to look at things through a slightly different lens, to see how we could adjust our mindset, see how we could see where we're missing things, seeing what we don't know. And also as a way of sharing that information, as a way of talking to other companies doing interesting things and saying, what are you guys doing? We all want to do good things. We all want to talk together and let's, have a conversation you, you, you know even if we don't win this thing let's make some friends and let's let's all make good stuff together Faye thank you so much and Lewis across to you you know the same for Hyperluminal Games what was it that incentivizes incentivized HLD to kind of ap apply for this and then you know commit so fully to, through the program yeah, so at HLG, we have an ethos that we want to create games for good. And throughout the development process of every game we've worked on, we've always been considering accessibility. But we saw the program as a chance to really further our knowledge and bridge any gaps that we had in accessibility and also try and make our games much more inclusive, which was something we really want to start doing along with making them more accessible so that way we can create truly wholesome experiences for all of our players i think that's really you know that bridging gaps and extending knowledge is something that everyone's doing and you know that starting point we talked about it i know a lot through the lab itself is this is a journey and it's a journey that we're all on and you actually never get off and as soon as you kind of take away the that there is a there to get to it starts to become a much more comfortable journey because you go ah oh, this is okay we're just all on that journey somewhere and actually we all can learn from each other because we've all had different experiences along that journey 
Um, we certainly saw a lot of that in the lab, that cross-room learning that you know, I know I really appreciated and was part of you know, our journey of knowledge. Opening to you know the others in the room, you know not you know stepping outside of the Story Futures and Engage specific program. So to you know everyone else in the room, what are the you know what's driven your intentions around inclusive uh, innovation and particularly in the immersive environment? You know what challenges have you had, and and how have you you know what what's been the intention and goals that you've got around immersive innovation? Please feel free to just come off the mic to anyone who wishes to share. So I can jump in here since I already uh, spoke in the, the channel there. My name is James Reinhardt. I'm CEO at Rhinocom uh, Consultants. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit and then I might throw a little question on the tail end of it because I, I want to take this opportunity. Um, so we're looking at developing software for disabled veterans, uh, particularly in the US government VA healthcare system. And uh, because there's a lot of um, evidence uh, treatment, evidence-based treatments around um, uh, working with pain management, PTSD, depression is fantastic. Um, and we have a passion to deliver that to uh, fellow veterans. Um, and um, I guess my uh, struggles and, and where I'd like to, to get some feedback is, um, as we know, and the game developers can speak to, is that uh, gamification uh, is something that can be imbued into any software platform, right? And it's something that, that is uh, core to, to our ideology or methodology is that we want to have this uh, gamification aspects um, to encourage behaviors within the platform in a, in a uh, XR environment, how uh, as developers, uh, do you see um, the, uh, the best way to uh, adapt um, maybe even traditional gamification practices uh, directly, still keeping those accessible needs individuals, um, you know, uh, not, gamifying around those, you know, including them within that process, um, having the cues or whatever it takes, um, you know, I guess what, what sort of challenges do you see in that and how, how do you uh, accomplish those? James, thank you so much for introducing yourself and, and you know, really interesting, you know, area that you're working in. When, can I just clarify the question, is it the challenge in relation to using gamification techniques in XR, in immersive environments specifically, that you're wanting yes, to- Yes, absolutely. You, so yeah. so because of XR challenges, or yeah. I mean, excuse me, accessibility challenges, yeah. um, you know, what, what sort of, um, uh, you know, how does that affect, I guess, um, mm. you know, the, the experts here um, and how do they approach those particular aspects of uh, including gamification within software? Fabulous question. I'll give a little bit of thought, so a little bit of thought around the accessibility side, and then um, Lewis, if I can pass to you on thoughts, you know, given in, it's the gaming environment um, from a kind of hyperluminal games and thinking about the XR, you know, gamifying XR games. From the accessibility side and thinking about how people differ and how gamification can make that more or less complex because of that difference. One of the things is um equal but different so providing ways that people can engage with a game that feels like it's sufficiently challenging but fit but fair and enjoyable and if you're requiring that people interact in a very specific way that some people might not be able to do and that the immersive engagement hasn't allowed for that difference, whether it's people who are gaming one handed versus two handed or people that have you know, limited vision and therefore are engaging with a sound based interface and so on, and maybe not getting all of the information at the same time as someone who's sighted. Just thinking about if they're engaging with others, making sure that that engagement is enjoyable and just user testing that so that that can be set to an environment that if it's multiplayer games, that that multiplayer experience is enjoyable, irrespective of 
how people are interfacing with that and obviously some of those challenges in immersive are different to the challenges in 2D some of them are similar like uh, game controllers um, some of them are different because the game controllers are different or the interface design is different and so just engaging with the community and seeing what works um, and giving people different options of how they're stepping in and how they're enjoying the game. I know some of the bit, you know, really interesting games have allowed different ways that people can game and some of it's competitive and some's non-competitive, for example. So people can enjoy it as they wish, but there's still that layering. And the other thing is that creating ways for people to feel achievement and feel development and progression that's not necessarily multiplayer, but is still giving people that incentive to come back and to feel that reward of having been there. And particularly when it's got a kind of therapeutic benefit and whether it's pain management or, or mental health management, um, such as the experiences you're talking about, again, to give people options of how they would wish to see that progression. And if obviously progression is very much in the eye of the beholder. So rather than have a very good answer here, it's again going to be um, a, a classic open answer which is go and work with the community and co-create that progression in a way that's really meaningful to that community. That's more on the accessibility side. Um, Lewis, have you got any thoughts in terms of how, you know, in immersive environments, gamification can work really well? Yeah, so we found that co-design sessions, just pulling in people from the community and just speaking to them either through a focus group arranged by open inclusion or with a client we're currently working with, they've been really great sources of information on what our potential audience really wants and expects from the game they're going to be playing. This includes specific features that are going to make it easier for them to see things in the game, but as well just giving them the option to change the controls or how they're going to be interacting with the game so for us it is just engage with the community that you're going to be building these products for and just talk to them present them your ideas either with um screen mock-ups or any concept art and stuff that you guys have or even prototypes letting people get their hands on things as early as possible to get all of that feedback in is a great way to really make them feel more included and also work on any little bits of accessibility that needs to be improved, especially if the community can point out areas where they're finding it difficult to interact with your game, your product, getting them to give you that feedback very early on has been really great for us in terms of trying to improve our accessibility and the tools we're delivering to them as well. Lewis, thank you so much for that. And actually that really early comment that you make, you know, just to give people some of the ideas that came through the workshops that we were doing as we were lining up for this lab and we were talking to the XR Access community, you know, we got anything from use Play-Doh or Plasticine to create 3D environments if you're still in that really early mock-up stage or get a piece of paper, you know, multiple pieces of paper, stick them together and make the 3D environment with, with the images either printed out or even just drawn on it um, or describe it to people and say, if you're at this stage and almost do that, you know, cognitive walkthrough of an experience and even at that very, very early stage and using these very hacky early ways of sharing with someone what you're thinking about to get their thoughts feeding back on it. Um, you can get some really powerful insights from people that can help inform the design and, and actually save quite a lot of design and development time going in a direction that might not be so appreciated. And even if you don't have any sort of prototypes coded, if you can build interactive prototypes using Adobe XD, Figma, or Sketch as well, and just share those and let people interact with them, that can be another great way to figure out what needs to be improved and where without having to code anything. Absolutely. And in fact, if anyone's interested, the session yesterday when we were talking about user research in XR, Lynn Cox, who was um, a blind uh, tech savvy uh, participant in research, was talking about even when it doesn't work, just if even if it doesn't work for, say, someone who's a screen reader or someone who's you know significantly visually impaired, there's still so many ways in which she could be engaged in providing really meaningful feedback um, at early stages of design, 
even when it's it's partially there but she needs help to get in you know, someone can help her in and then she can go and interact with the experience so some really lovely ways that you can do that even when it's early stage and not quite accessible to everyone as yet or already um, to be shared i might go on to learning and how we learn about you know how do we actually go about demystifying innovation in the immersive environment specifically thinking about people with additional needs and how to make it more inclusive of all fiona if i can go back to you, you know, what is it that you really wanted the lab to deliver and how did you and others you've spoken to from story futures who attended it find the actual learning process of the of the four-day lab what surprised you what challenged you or what extended your perspective or reinforced considerations you might have before or awareness that you had already had um, yeah, lots of things. I mean, definitely after delivering the lab and seeing the impact it had on the teams and the companies, you know, it raised the question, how could you not design XR experiences in any other way? Just fundamentally, it just, it, it really turned people's attitudes to how they design games and experiences on its head. Um, I think Lewis and Freya will be nodding there saying one participant on the lab at one of the, um, I think midway through on the second day said, I fundamentally changed how my company is going to actually work and grow and what our future trajectory is going to look like because of, of um, attending the lab. And that was because of the great work and the tools and the knowledge that was shared. But it also felt to me like a lot of this knowledge was inherently sitting within the company already, but they lacked the navigational tool to pull it out and make sense of it. Because the way in which as soon as the pennies dropped and as soon as some new information came in or as soon as they saw an innovation canvas that put the ideas together in a different way, in a different order than, than, than they may have previously thought, there was like, ah, we kind of knew that already. Why didn't we just think about it in a different, in a different way or put it together um, put it together with a different team of people and um, brought other people into the thinking process and the co-design and co-creation process. So the aha moments, I think, were wonderful, but they came from, I think, a very deep-rooted sense that these companies at the heart of this were in the room and present because they were passionate about inclusive design. And inherently, some of that intelligence sat within the company already. They just needed the navigation tool to find it. Oh, I love that. And, and I absolutely echo that, that the intent was in the room and was so strong day one before we even started and it really was just unlocking that intent and making it easier for people to know where to step next or how to use that intent more powerfully within their organizations um, yeah and and that intent is is not everywhere but it was absolutely um, uh, consistent across the organizations that were in that lab so um, it was hence it was such a fun experience to be part of um, Fiona, from the Sugar Creative um, perspective, how did you find, in the team at Sugar Creative find the lab? What were the most impactful parts of the experience for you, given where your organisation was at the time? And how has it helped develop the con creative considerations or potential future approach um, in your organisation? Sure. So we found the lab. It was a challenge, but it was a, it was a very joyful challenge. It was really lovely being able to see all these people with very different lived experiences have a very genuine conversation of what works for you and what doesn't work for you often being very surprised by the stuff that works it was really good to see someone say actually my phone does most of what i need it to do it, it has all the tools right here you, you don't need to make anything just let these tools work let the tools work in your own system and that's that's wonderful to have stuff just kind of click together and know it works together. We came in with an initial awareness. I think everyone did, uh, as Fiona was saying, but it really broadened the kind of intersectionality of all of the, these kind of spectrums of needs and wants. And knowing that there is no universal design, there is no one thing we can add and then everyone will be able to use the product or enjoy the product, but it's about, how do we add options for everyone? And then how do we make these options known as well, rather than just having a big settings menu that has every single thing under the sun? How do people know it's there? How do they know how to use it? Do they need to be tech savvy to come in? Are we putting a lot on the user? So, so that's what we got out of the lab from, from Sugar side. 
Thank you so much. And I think, you know, a few things there, obviously there is no one size fits everyone. Um, so, you know, use universal design as far as it can go, but that building in options is so critical, but still insufficient. And I love the fact that, you know, Sugar Creative right from the start went, well, it's great, but then how do people find that and how, you know, making sure that they are known and findable to users um, is an absolutely critical step in making it more inclusive and usable to everyone. Um, across to you, uh, to Lewis, do you want to talk about from the Hyperluminal Games, the lab experience itself, how was that for Hyperluminal and how did that influence your considerations? Yeah, so we all really enjoyed the labs at Hyperluminal. We did all go in with some prior knowledge about accessibility and some inclusivity, but Oh, the lab really did open our eyes. Like our main takeaway from it was, as Faye had or has already said, a lot of users felt that when it comes to finding their accessibility tools and options, they just can't find them. But for myself personally, it was um, that not everything that you build is going to suit everyone's needs. I had gone in with this conception that when you're giving feedback to your players, you need to make sure you've got redundant loops. So not only are you using some sort of animation, color change, you're also pairing that with sound and potentially as well haptic feedback through the controller. And one part is, and I like this sort of stuff myself as a deaf person who is deaf and losing the rest of my hearing, I often use those uh, vibration functions in controllers in order to give myself feedback, but some participants during the labs actually voice that vibration functions in controllers can cause them serious amounts of pain, and that's when we realized that having all of these feedback options turned on at the same time can be detrimental to the player's overall experience. So giving them the option to configure this from when they start up our games is gonna be a key thing we're gonna be doing and our key takeaway from the labs as well. Yeah, that was so interesting. And I remember sitting in on that one where um, you know, one of our participants was sharing that haptic feedback can really cause quite a lot of pain for her. And you know, it's just such a, interesting consideration that something that is so helpful for some people such as people with hearing loss or you know for any reason that haptic is particularly helpful to them for other people might be getting in the way so that optionality again really coming through strongly over to everyone you know when it comes to learning and you know how have you engaged in learning about um, immersive you know inclusion and particularly when you're involved in innovation spaces where have you reached out to and what's really worked for you or what's not been so helpful in your learning process to hear? If it's all right, I'll just jump into this one so that way you can hopefully Please give people the confidence to yeah. chime in. So for us at Hyperluminal, um, we've really found that the focus groups that we've been doing with open inclusion have been a great way to learn about innovation in immersive environments like just getting people's feedback and their experiences overall with the products they interact with is really influencing our learning and what we're trying to apply but as well working with in-game as well they've been sharing a wealth of research papers articles that have all been published quite recently on how to really improve um, inclusivity as well and uh, we've been using those to build a language within the studio that we're going to that will be applied to the guidelines we're building to really move forward what we're trying our learning within the studio and in getting more people involved and becoming more and more inclusive and accessible to all of our games I think there's so much in that, Lewis, because what you've just talked about, you know, we talked about in the lab, we talk about user experts, solution experts and enabling experts. And, you know, you've got access to those user experts through those focus groups and being able to directly interact and, and learn from their experiences and their expertise as users with you know different and, and quite diverse uh, access needs the solution expertise that you've been able to lean on in game and really learn from them and the different ways that they've considered and and learned in in a whole range of environments of gaming um, and then of course there's an 
you know, enabling experts, which are people like, again, in-game that put together this lab and made it possible um, or, you know, open facilitating the focus groups, really enabling these elements and engagement to happen. Anyone else um, from, you know, across the group who's, you know, how has your learning experience been? What's been the easy part of learning or what's been a harder part of learning about immersive innovation? I'm happy to put a bit of the what, what's been hard for me is I think nobody ever has all parts of it and I'm the non-technical person who understands the user side but doesn't understand the technology limitations so it's always partnering and um, bringing different sets of knowledge together so a little bit like I was just kind of summarizing of what you were saying um, Lewis is I can kind of see and hear what people want but I don't know the limitations of the technology or particularly the mid-stage technology to be able to test out something on the way, um, let alone the end technology, which is moving all the time as well. So it's that matching what people want with, with what's possible is the never ending journey. I think that's so right, Christine. I mean, to check what James, James's point earlier about um, um, his, his question in relation to the games, um, um, gamification working uh, with, um, with vets. In the UK, particularly, one big gap we have, and it may be different elsewhere, um, is really the missing piece of the, the innovation puzzle is actually the right people who need to be together to have those conversations, just not being in the same place at the same time. So, you know, having the clinicians and the rehabilitation clinicians and the right researchers, clinical researchers, clinical professions in the room with the, with the game designers and the XOR creators and the co-creative community at the same time to make sure that that innovation process and cycle is populated with the right people who can feed in at the right points. So to your point, Christine, we might have two or three of them, but we fall down a hole because then suddenly we're missing a huge, we're missing the co-creation community or the, the clinicians. We can't get, can't get in touch with the clinicians. So if we can do, we can work to get that bit right, that we really are onto a, in, in a really strong place, I think. Eric, I see your head's gone up. Over to you. Yeah. <clears throat> so my name is Eric Milos. Um, a lot of what I do with virtual reality is on a client-based system. So what we're looking at is um, how do we, one of the challenges that we have found, so I'm fairly tech savvy. And what we found is that the people that I've been rolling this out to uh, across the province here is that, a, not everybody that I'm working with has the time to sort of learn how to present this to their clients and to figure out what kind of different accessibility issues they might have. They're almost learning it at the same time the client is. As uh, one of my colleagues here is working on a project development um, of creating some new simulations, one of the things that we've been really working on is how do we make this accessible for the client but also, how do we give the facilitator of the session the tools so that they can just sit down and kind of have things laid out in front of them to assist the client in real time as they're going with as little requirement of tech knowledge or sort of pre-work that they have to do. Most of the facilitators that I'm working with are sort of wearing about a hundred million different hats. And so to switch from one thing to another and where we found the issue was, was an engagement. How do we get a facilitator to recommend this to the client when they're overwhelmed by the technology and just sort of taking it out of the box and trying to run a simulation? What am I looking for? How is this actually gonna benefit my client? How do I take as much of that struggle out of the picture for them so that they have more freedom to assist whoever is in the headset with whatever um, accessibility issue or just um, learning that the client is trying to get out of it. 
Eric, I think that's such an important role. And in fact, um, again, you know, reflecting back on yesterday's discussion around research, we had uh, Randy Husenek um, as one of the participants in that discussion, and he's a clinician. And, you know, I think that's a really important consideration that often with XR, there are two clients, not always, but there is often this mid layer client and the end user client. And whether it's in an education system that you've got to get the teachers to a point or the educators to a point that they're really confident in being able to position it to their students in a way that is also adaptive to different students with different needs, or whether it's with a clinician through to, you know, people that are coming in for various layers of levels of treatment, um, or whether it's in a workplace because it's a workplace training tool and really thinking about a diverse workplace, how does the employee or the person who's doing the learning and training in that workplace make sure that there's they can support different users with different needs without having to become a tech savvy, you know, XR expert because it's been designed in for their experience as well really, really important considerations. And I think increasingly so because it, you know, XR is being used in so many of those places that have multi-level engagement points. Right, if we, we might just go to thinking about how we transition that knowledge into the really important part, outcome. So if we kind of talk about the accelerator itself in our case study now, the really fun part has been watching Hyperluminal Games and Sugar Creative, you know, who have both won this funding to be able to take their ideas through to fruition, um, now move them forward from an idea to a reality. So, you know, Fiona, again, first to you, how have you found really watching and engaging with the development of these ideas as they went from a pitch through to through the accelerator into a reality? Incredibly impressed, <laughs> essentially. Incredi incredibly impressed at how both projects just were out the gate super quickly, armed, ready to go with the information and the ambition and the, the and passion uh, to, to put what they've learned into practice. And I think we, we when we designed this program, we weren't quite sure what types of projects would be submitted with the teams. So we thought some projects might just want to, to experiment in a risk-free way and not actually come up with the finished product not feel the pressure to actually create something shiny and finished. So we allowed for that. But in um, from, from the UK side of things, Lewis can speak to the, the, the Scottish partner um, partner project. But from the UK side of things, we've got a project that's going to be shiny and launched. So I think Faye can speak to probably the pressure and the timelines and the reality that that launch brings in terms of this accelerator process. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I, I'm so excited to now pass it over to, to Faye and then Lewis, but Faye, you first with the work that you're doing at Sugar Creative, absolutely you know, bolting out of the gates. How are you going with that transition from you know, a really powerful and very um, innovative concept through to trying to make that real? What's been the really enjoyable, fun and exciting parts, but also what have been the challenging bits? You know, what have been the bits that have been more difficult to that you might not have uh, expected when it was a shiny idea on a piece of paper. Sure. So to uh, quickly give a, a little bit of background of what we're making, just just so that's clear, I, I won't go super deep into it, but we are looking at making a uh, gesture capture tool so that someone speaking BSL or ASL can record their hands that can be captured, moved into 3D and put into VR environment, an AR environment, we have a VR game that's coming out relatively soon, and we wanted to put that content in there so that BSL native speakers could experience the game in their own language, in their potentially first language. Um, one of the challenges with this was at first we made an assumption. We didn't realize that facial tracking was as important to that language as it was. So we realized, okay, we're going to adjust our scope. We're gonna spend more time on the tool, less time on the kind of the outcomes of the tool. So for now, it's only going to be one product with the plan being that we're going to make it nice and modular so that in the future, it will be easier for us to move this along. But we realized actually we need more time to really look at what's important. Do I need to capture the, our hands moving fast? Is the gesture more important? Just understanding we don't know 
everything about this language and we need to learn about it before we know how to put that into VR and AR. The other problem as well, but not, not problem, sorry, a, a new design consideration is that we don't have to stick to 2D. So uh, a subtitle would be 2D, maybe floating in space, maybe you would have an ASL, BSL user in a small pop-out window in the corner. Now that we're in VR and we're designing it to be as part of the story, we can have a character doing sign to the user. Where do we put that character? How do we draw the, the user's eye to the character without distracting from the story? How does it add to the story? These are really interesting design considerations that I think without this, we wouldn't have gotten to explore and play with. So. It's, it's been really fun, it's been difficult, but that's that's kind of where we are with that. I, I absolutely love this project. I love the fact that you were prepared to change scope when you went, ah, oh, face is important as well. Yep, we can't just do hands. We need to reflect this language in its entirety to be able to communicate effectively. But also I love the considerations that this has triggered because what you've done, it's like unpicking one part of the knot takes you to the next part that you get to, which in this case is where do you put this character? If you've got, you know, someone who's using BSL within the, you know, within the story, where do you place this for minimum distraction but maximum utilization? And this is exactly the same consideration that actually one of the other groups that I think that's either right now or is in the next group is around captioning um, and placement of, of captioning uh, is the same in 2D. It's really obvious where it is in 3D. It could be in many places. And it's that how do you work with users to know the right place to place this content when you're in an immersive environment? Eric. Wait, I find what you're saying very really interesting and it's sort of as you were speaking, I was trying to frame a question in my head that ends up tying in really nicely. But uh, I guess my question is, in terms of the the facial tracking and even extending to full body um, hand tracking and that conveyance of emotional context, um, having explored a little bit in uh, Horizon Worlds and stuff, some of that absence was very very glaring and very very jarring to me and thinking of my own context and uh people that i know even outside of physical disabilities different neurodivergencies and how they interact socially and some of the struggles and where i can only imagine that the gaming world in vr is going with respect to online multiplayer games and how that's going to be. I'm thinking of a specific experience that I had where an avatar was approaching me and it was a really, really bizarre experience because I'm just looking at this blank character face and there's no context. I don't know if they're approaching me with some ill intent, friendly, flirtatious. I have no idea. Um, so I guess I was just curious about what the general, your general thoughts on that from a more social perspective between uh, other players and uh, and social VR. No, that's that's a really wonderful point. Um, I, I've made a point to mention before is I love the idea of the dropped curve effect, where in making one small tool for a very specific thing, it has all of these other outcomes. So for us looking at a tool that would help with gestures based language, immediately it's then opened up to, actually this might help with social VR, this could go into this. And I think that's so wonderful and why these conversations are so important to say, hey, have you considered your thing can actually fix this issue over here? And I absolutely agree that I've been in VR chat before and it can be really unsettling to just have this character. Often they're quite tall, they have no face animation and they're just kind of looming over you and you're like, I don't know how to approach you. Hello, you're some stranger. I don't know you. I, I don't know your attention. So I think that's really wonderful. I'd love to see more tools brought into VR that allow not just character expression and capturing, but player to player being able to say, hey, here's me. I'm showing my emotions to you in a way that you can understand and see and read easily. So I, I think that's wonderful. 
I absolutely agree, Faye. And actually during the lab, we had one of our participants who's on the autism spectrum talk about the fact that in his avatar, he'd prefer to not have a face because then he doesn't have to feel that someone's looking at his eyes, which is really uncomfortable for him. So his preferred avatar would be an avatar that has no face. And what's really interesting about that is in social VR, that's a social experience. And for someone else, having an avatar coming at you that has no face has taken away some of that human characteristics that make us more comfortable that in making him more comfortable by removing it has made other people so this is actually quite parallel to real world experiences of two-sided empathy of how do you design in ways that make it easier for people to feel more confident whether they have heightened anxiety and might find someone coming, you know, particularly if they were taller and, you know, they might have had some experiences that, that they want to feel safe, even though it's a virtual environment. Um, and the same for someone wishing to uh, minimise the risk of interaction that would be uncomfortable. There was one of our team, she's a researcher and has done a lot of work in independent living with children with autism. And one of those children had said to her that, their ideal avatar would have no ears because then there's no risk of them having uncomfortable sounds. They have very sens heightened sensory overload quite easily from sound. And even just seeing the ears going into a busy environment made them very uncomfortable. So by removing the ears, that gave them the confidence to be in that virtual space and feel safe. So I think there's so much yet to be found, but these are some of the fabulous conversations that exactly as Faye's saying, this can trigger. I'm wondering, and, and so it's, I'm glad you mentioned the autism spectrum. That was sort of where my head was at too, um, having family members that deal with a lot of struggles with that. And I think that, you know, when we're talking about immersive tech, one of the things that we jump to is that it's a first person perspective and that you're interacting in a, on a first person basis and i'm as this conversation is going on i'm thinking back to what lewis was saying earlier about you know allowing the player to select okay what sort of inputs am i receiving and for those on the autism spectrum that would prefer not to have a face I'm wondering if a shift in perspective, if you could go to more of a third person character control, then you can overcome some of that, uh, you know, their avatar can have a face, but their avatar is over there and they can actually be physically removed from the situation, controlling it over there and in some have themselves distanced from the situation. Uh, just thoughts that are popping into my head as the conversation goes on really really interesting conversation and in fact that particular idea of first and third we've seen tested um, rick's owner ran a marathon in the metaverse that they called the metathon that was specifically inclusive so for people that might not wish to or be able to run a marathon in real life that they could experience running a marathon in the metaverse and they were really using it as a um experiment in that space knowing it was very early and that they, they would probably find many barriers that was specifically disability inclusive um, that they'd probably find many barriers but that was actually the purpose and, and process one of the things they did do is allow both first person and third person view so people could choose you know were they in there right at the front or were they actually watching themselves and what was that positioning that was more comfortable and confident for them We've also had um, participants in research that we've done in XR specifically where they've said they would love to go to an XR concert. They would just love to because they can't in real life because of their neurodiversity. Being in the physical proximity of so many people would just not be possible um, or through heightened anxiety. So that's an experience that today they feel they really miss out. And ideally, they'd like to be able to be there in the mosh pit for a little bit of time and then the moment they felt uncomfortable step out and be able to watch it you know like from a balcony experience so back to this really goes to Faye's comment before about giving options and actually you know Lewis was saying the same that optionality that there's not one size fits all here but by listening to people's desires for where they wish to have experience you can then design those layers in because obviously the lovely thing about 
immersive is you do have those options to design it in once you're aware of the need. Lewis, I do want to pass to you though, with the, you know, turning the idea that was pitched to um, the in-game side of the, uh, the lab into a reality. How's that experience been for you? And what's made, you know, what's made that much easier and what's been more difficult than you might have expected when it was still on paper? Yeah, so what's been more difficult for us is genuinely just finding the time. A lot of us are split between a lot of different projects and we really wanted to give Pine Hearts a lot more love and attention because we wanted to create this cute little wholesome game that should, that tells the story of how this character is dealing with the loss of a loved one and reliving the memories of their childhood. And while we're not going to be having a first person view in the games told entirely through a third person perspective, what we wanted to make sure was that every player had the exact same chance to experience the story and give them the tools to interact with the story they needed. And one thing we're looking at is including a color blocking mode that's going to desaturate the game world, but then place focus more on the characters and interactable objects within the game world as well because a few participants in focus groups and some co-design sessions we ran said that they were struggling to find things within the game world and so we wanted to make sure that we can bring give them the option to bring these into their direct focus and occlude everything else that's not important to them as well but as well we've also been struggling to um, acquire accessibility controllers and start testing on these uh, simply due to the chip shortage as well. It's been quite difficult getting a hold of these at a retail price. So that way we can also then start building new input methods for players, including um, the ability for players on console and PC to turn on an on-screen cursor and tell the character where they want to go rather than having to physically move them with some sort of thumbstick. And I'm sorry, I completely lost my train of thought there. <laughs> That's okay. You were just talking about, you know, the the getting access to the controllers and, and particularly the challenge of being able to, you know, yourself um, at Hyperluminal Games get get the various items to be able to test things out. Yeah, so because our hope is that once we get these controllers in, we're going to start reaching out to the local community here in Dundee and try and get some people to come in and play our game using these controllers specifically, just to so that way we can fine tune the experience and just make things that much more easier for them to experience the story of Pine Hearts. I really like the fact that despite the difficulties, it's being grounded in the story. You know, it's grounded in where is the heart of the experience? You know, you literally called Pine Hearts, you know, but it's that where is the heart of the experience? And same as Faye was talking about, what is the heart of that story? What are the bits that are most important to put front and center? And what are the things that are okay to put a little bit to the side? Or if people want increasing focus, that they're the ones that you know to drop away. And I think that clarity of what it is that the creative experience you really want to hold to the center of that experience and what's more peripheral to that experience is something that you know we see in in you know the really good organizations like yourselves that have you know a lot of experience in creating games or creating storytelling but that what's at the center and what's more peripheral and that's even more important in inclusive considerations because you can help choose as you provide optionality, which of those you back off and which you bring in. Over to anyone, we, we are at, you know, we've got 10 minutes left to go. So a really open conversation now um, to everyone around, uh, you know, immersive innovation. Anything you'd like to ask of this group and, um, you know, please, please feel free to put your hand up or just unmic yourself and ask. While you're thinking of things, Fiona, could I just ask you any last thoughts that you might have that you'd love to share with people that are particularly considering, you know, immersive innovation in the XR space? Um, I think um, for we're we're fortunate with Story Futures Academy that we have UKRI funding and we've got the ability to put on programs um, 
but what we have learned is there is such a demand from the sector, from companies, from individuals, from businesses, from researchers themselves. It's just find fellow creators. This is what XR Access is all about. Really, the thing that I've learned is the biggest thing you can leverage that doesn't cost anything that's out there is a network that can help you find the friends and the allies and the people to bounce ideas off at this point in time is so invaluable. Um, and everybody in the, you know, we, we continually refer people to XR Access in this group as, as the home in which to find fellow like-minded um, people to collaborate with. But I think for me, in terms of organization, organizationally, Christine, I think the biggest challenge for us, um, for Story Features Academy and other organizations that are fortunate enough to be able to design and run these types of programs is to ask the question, what can we do to help the government and the people who have the funding to put behind um, training programs like this to think about um, the innovation process itself and how from start to finish, inclusive in best practice and inclusive design thinking can go into the heart of the innovation journey. And um, whether that is from how funding early stage R&D calls are designed, how they're written, what communities they're engaged with, right through to the types of companies that are selected and the application form and the webinars through to um, you know, making sure that every opportunity is given for applicants to actually put um, inclusive thinking into how they design XR experiences. And that's a journey. And I think there is a, certainly a, a, a willingness and an ambition for that to be done. But I think we've got a, a long way to go before we actually get there. But I feel very passionate about um, supporting making that happen. Can I just say, I so love the role that you have always played within the, you know, Story Futures Academy and, and you know, previously in, you know, Universe UK and, and others, because there's not enough voices like yours that understand how powerful inclusive design can be in the innovation space. And what you've just outlined there, in fact, I had a conversation just earlier today with, you know, someone else in this space saying you know, there is so much innovation spending that happens, whether it's public money or private money, that doesn't take who is going to receive the benefits of that innovation into account to a significant enough degree. And what you, you know, you've just outlined the other part of the problem, which is, and who can even apply for that funding because the process itself is more or less inclusive and accessible. So I think it's such an important consideration. And I love the fact that you went there in the heart of the, um, you know, the innovation funding circle, you know, aware of that. And I just really um, would love to see that across, you know, other parts of the innovation um, ecosystem and say, whether it's VCs, whether it's government funded innovation centers, whether it's, um, you know, anyone putting money into innovation, they should be asking who are going to, who am I listening to and who am I missing out on listening to because of the way I've done this? And who may benefit from this innovation and who may miss out from the benefit of this innovation on the basis of this, which both has, you know, not only is there an equity layer to this, absolutely, but there's also just a straight commercial benefit of making things that are more consistently delightful to a large audience. Lewis, over to you in terms of any last thoughts you'd like to share um, with the community here today. Yeah, so my biggest takeaway from this is the sooner you start considering accessibility and inclusivity into your game or your experience, the easier it's going to be to implement it down the line. So we're fortunate enough that Pine Hearts is in the early development stage, and so we're able to build this toolkit and start reworking what we've already built to easily integrate what we're building in the toolkit. But we're also hoping to take what we're learning from this experience and apply it to our future games and some games we're also currently building as well, including Venture Valley, as well as Cloud Jumper, our new big IP that's coming soon as well. We're going to be taking what we're learning here and applying with Pinehearts and applying that to future products as well. And we're going to be considering from the early on stages of any new game we build or client project we join, how can we improve the accessibility and make it much more inclusive in the design process as well. Thank you so much, Lewis. And I'm going to pass straight to you, Faye, so we don't run out of time and you have time to share any last thoughts you'd like to join. Yeah, I would say uh, the biggest thing 
that we'd like to see more of and embody ourselves is transparency, being honest about your own failures, uh, sharing those failures, sharing those learnings, because I think we're all here because we want to make good stuff together and being able to have that more open communication and also work with universities when you can. Uh, we're partners with uh, USW, that's the University of South Wales, and they have been so wonderful at kind of taking the data we've given them. They get lots of data, we get lots of wonderful information. It's such a wonderful kind of symbiotic relationship that I guarantee universities near you want to work with you, want to see what you're doing, and will have really great insight. So yeah, just share with everyone, talk to communities. Faye, absolutely. And I think, you know, XO Access itself has Cornell Tech as one of the founding members of it. We've worked with a number of universities and of course, you know, the Story Futures Academy and, and InGame are both really strongly supported and grounded in university academics um, behind them. There is so much energy in universities and um, opportunity for bright people that are looking for projects, as you say, that would give them real life experience and real life data. And yet, you know, a lot, a lot of interest in how they could use that and help you make that transition um, to the next stage. So much to learn. Anyone, uh, anyone else got any questions to us before? We've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, any thoughts either on the session today or thoughts that haven't been shared in the session that you think are really important to it? I, this isn't directly uh, a question or anything, but I just want to thank all the panel members. Uh, really inspiring what you guys are doing, and uh, the the contributions today uh, we'll certainly take back in into in house, and uh, we'll we'll shift our direction on on how we approach things. And I really really appreciate your guys' time and and expertise today. Oh, thank you so much, James. You know, it's an absolute pleasure. And really, as Fiona was saying before, this is a journey none of us can do alone. You know, none of us have got this. This is a whole new emerging range of technologies, not even technology, but suite of technologies that can more powerfully solve for a whole range of challenges that exist out in the communities today, whether it's being entertained, being educated, managing pain, managing therapies you know th there are so many ways in which these technologies can be applied if we engage across the community and we learn from each other what from this even from this program what hyperluminal games are doing what sugar creative are doing really pushing the bounds of innovation in their spaces in really fabulous ways will be way ahead of many others in their space but equally equally there'll be many others that are way ahead in other areas that we can all learn from. So that coming coming together and sharing, that's exactly what this is about. So I'm glad it was useful to you today. It's always useful to me hearing, um, hearing from others. It is time to leave the breakout room. Um, thank you so much, firstly, and, and you know, to everyone coming here today on their Friday morning or afternoon as it is. And absolutely, Fiona, Faye, Lewis, thank you so much for brilliant contributions and sharing your experiences of the story futures and in game lab thank you to you christine pleasure let's, let's go back in <laughs>